Code BS. Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Buy and sell tickets in two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. Football fans, $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on NFL tickets. Use promo code BSNFL, download the SeatGeek app, or go right to SeatGeek.com. We're also brought to you by Gillette. A Gillette razor blade edge is thinner than a single brain cell. That's the product of many brain cells at work from the thousands of men and women at Gillette. They're always working harder to make your shave better. Now you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. Gillette, the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. We are also brought to you by the Ringer Podcast Network. That includes the Mass Man Show, talking about Sunday's big pay-per-view in LA against all odds with Cousin Sal, the Ringer NFL Show, the Ringer NBA Show, the Watch, Channel 33, God, I we have so House of Carbs. We have so many I can't even keep track. Go to the ringer.com's podcast page. You can find all of them there. Subscribe to all of them. Everything you'd ever want in a podcast. We we probably have it. We probably have the right host. Don't forget about the ringer.com. Every Friday, my mailbag com again. Yeah. Every Friday. You're listening to this on a Friday. That means my column is up right now. You can hear see mailbag emails. See my picks. I'm in a little bit of a slump, but I'm going to snap out of it this week. TheRinger.com, go there. Go there for all of our stuff, including our big NBA preview that's going on right now. Let's get to the pot, but first, Pearl Jam. Ah, oh, now we're down to 38 minutes. This is like the, the shortest podcast I've ever had. Um, that's Malcolm Gladwell. He has a podcast called Revisionist History that's insanely successful. We've done a lot of these. We've done some back and forth in print. We have done uh, some podcasts. We're, we're mixing it up today. We're playing a game. You want to explain the game? The game is uh, each of us has written out uh, 10 names, concepts, whatever, on pieces of little slips of paper. I wrote out 10 for Bill. Bill wrote out 10 for me. We don't know what those names are. We're going to pluck them out, and we have to do a little riff on whatever we, whatever the, the word on the piece of paper is. I wrote the names of 10 porn sites. I, I wasn't <laughs> going to tell you until we were on there. I just wanted to see how you would react. <laughs> well, this is an away game for you, because you're the guest, so you have to, you have to pick a name first. Yeah. Right. I hope this works. You guys, you guys. Rick Pitino. Oh, oh my. Rick Patino, topical. Uh, <laughs> Very topical. Uh, Rick, I think as of the end of today, will be an ex-coach. Yeah, I think he already is. I, think I don't think there's is. a lot of bites. Um, I will just say, since we're, we're going to race through these, right, Bill? Yeah. Uh, very quickly, this is a classic. This is almost the perfect NCAA scandal where the scandal is not what is actually happening, what is alleged to have happened. The scandal is that what has happened is scandalous, if that makes sense. The only decent thing that has happened in amateur sports and in amateur intercollegiate sports in the last however many years is that athletes have managed to get paid. Yeah, to get bribed. To get bribed. Yeah. I mean, this is, as far as I can tell, everything else about the NCAA is a scandal. This is fantastic. <laughs> At last, talented people who are making enormous sums of money for their school are getting a cut of the action. And what is it that we're now getting upset about? The very, the only good thing that's happened in the NCAA in, since it's in, since it's charter. It's probably going to get worse too, because we had, we don't know how many shoe companies are involved, but it, this is one of those things as a sports fan, you always knew who the, who the college was that was the so-and-so Adidas school or the Nike school. Yeah. And obviously they were doing something, but we, nobody could ever prove it. And then the FBI is like, we'll prove it. And they just demolished like all these different programs. And we have, I mean, they raided an NBA agent yesterday, the computer in his office, because obviously some of these agents are paying the players too. Yeah. So this could be the scandal that completely, we've had two different things. Oh, well, we'll talk about CT. I'm sure it's in one of these cups, but two different things happened this week that could completely alter sports. Yeah. The CT, the revelations with that. Don't, and then this cup. Yeah, I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right, I'm going to open a cup. <sighs> Sam Hinkie. So Sam Hinkie, um, Belated genius, I guess, is that what we'd call him? He figured out this loophole, he worked for the Sixers, figured out this loophole in the draft system that just to be intentionally bad, 
which was the, the, the kind of loophole nobody was hoping anybody would exploit, and he did. And it worked, but he got fired, and now he is a hero in Philadelphia. And I'm still not positive. Like, like he would say, well, I'm, why am I here? I got fired. Like, what, what I did didn't work, actually, because the team's still bad, and like Joel Embiid, like, they don't really have a guaranteed franchise player yet. But at the same time, it caused the NBA to kind of look at itself and be like, all right, teams are either going for the title or they're going for the number one lottery pick, but nobody wants to be in between those two yeah. spots. Yeah. And you're seeing it now, like you have the Warriors and everybody is so afraid to compete with the Warriors that we've had complete chaos in the people. And it's obviously for the ringer, it was fantastic because there was a new story every week. But, uh, but it's just, it's like watching somebody take a snow globe and just shake it. That's yeah. the NBA season. My, my thing about Hinky is, Hinkyism has now spread to the NFL, right? So if, the, if, if Hinkyism, Baseball first, then the NFL after. Yeah, if, if Hinkyism is the end of the gentleman's agreement in professional sports, that everyone will try to be as good as they possibly can, right? Yep. And what Hinky said is, actually, no, I don't want to be as good as I possibly can. If I can't be the best, then my, my, the, the best thing I can be is the worst. And this year, I feel like in the NFL, we've got, what? at least five or six teams that aren't even trying to be mediocre, that are yeah, trying like to be the worst that they could be. Seven or eight bad teams, yeah. yeah. Um, but can professional sports survive in when everyone is playing the hinky game? No. I mean, imagine if, like, you're launching your podcast. Imagine if this was your plan. I'm going to make my podcast terrible for four years. Yeah. And then eventually it'll be good because I'll be able to afford more engineering. I don't even know why anyone would do that. <laughs> yeah. um, it is but, the crazy... Uh, we, I, years ago, we had done a back and forth where we, we, I mean, I, we were discussing the draft and we talked about this notion that the fundamental idea behind the draft, which is that you reward teams for being bad, yes, was, is the it, worst idea in the terrible. world. And now we're terrible. finally, it, the chickens are coming home to roost. That's why I've been, for 10 years, I was pushing for this tournament where all the lottery teams would have to play at the end of the season, single elimination March Madness style. So then they couldn't fake injuries and do all the stuff they do to try to intentionally be bad. And they haven't done it. And it's, it's kind of crazy that they haven't tried to address like March and April. But on the other hand, like I would argue basketball is probably in the best shape of, of all these sports just because, you know, how marketable the guys are. It's football that I think will suffer the greatest uh, from hinkyism. Because you literally have five games per Sunday now that are unwatchable. Like, why would, under what circumstances would anyone compel me to watch the Cleveland Browns playing the New York Jets? I like how you call it hinkyism. I think, I think it's hinkyism. I think the man has started a, he, he, it's like Marxism. I mean, he reframed the way we think about the world. <laughs> the funniest thing about it is the Sixers fans love him now. Yeah. It was almost like Stockholm Syndrome sent in. Like they, they had four terrible seasons in a row, and they're like, we loved it. It was great. We got all these young guys that we love now, and yeah. they've talked themselves into it. So they're going to bring it back. Like Jedi mind it's trick like them. Napoleon. You know, they, he, he brings ruin to France. They exile him to where or Elbow, wherever the hell. And then remember, they bring him back, and everyone's like, yeah. Napoleon, Napoleon. I think that's what's going to happen with Inky. He's gonna, yeah. He'll be back. He's almost better off not coming back and then just having this one beautiful disaster that reshaped the league. <laughs> And then he'd be like, I don't know, I don't want to come back. I don't want to blow up your league again. And just like be a consultant. All right, pick another one. All right. Knicks fans. Oh. I mean, why would I even answer this? What is there to say? This, that masochism is alive and well, apparently, in the <laughs> metropolitan area. I actually think it is, as someone who lives in New York and has the option of being a Knicks fan that I have declined, um, <laughs> I would say that I have a... I think I have a fundamental ethical problem with being a Knicks fan, which is if I am a Knicks fan, then I am implicitly um, uh, supporting the decision making of Knicks ownership and management. Yeah. Um, I'm essentially saying to Mr. Dolan that I think you do a good job, right? I'm voting with my dollars to, in support of what he's done. And that is, um, that's wrong. I mean, it's more than wrong. That's outrageous. He's the dumbest owner. Is he? Is he the dumbest in the history of sports? Well, what's weird is he's not that bad of an NHL owner. That's the part that, for the Knicks fans, is the yeah, most well, frustrating. It's like, it's like somebody who's a great parent with one kid and then just a Bill, disaster the bar with is the other so, kid. The bar is so low in, in NHL. I mean, I do think that, to to the, not to defend Jim like, Dolan, but I do think there's a misconception. 
his problem is he delegates. He hires terrible people and then delegates to them. Like, he's not a meddler. He's not one of these owners who's like, oh, here's what I think. Wait, and wait. Bill, he's not like Bill. Jerry Jones. First of all, yeah, he delegates. He delegated to Isaiah Thomas, one of the worst that's I, delegations. But that's my point. Like, he would delegate to Bob the Doorman, who's well, now, like, the new GM. Like, yeah. he doesn't. But, uh, but it's like Phil Jackson. Well, I hired him. I don't want to intervene. And Phil Jackson's that's like, the kind of tapioca. That is seat. the, uh, what was that great George Bush phrase, the, uh, the, um, the, what was it? The soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, to say that in defense of Jim Dolan, yeah. that he delegates to morons is that is the soft bigotry of low expectations. That's I didn't how, say it was a good defense, <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. Yeah. I mean, but no, no, he is in, hires bad I people. Think, I think for every bad decision that has been made by a Jim Dolan surrogate, we can also identify a bad decision that was made by Jim Dolan himself. True. So the fact when you when you enter uh, New York City um, through the through the dungeon that is Penn Station, you know that's that's Jim Dolan's fault, right? right? He refuses. No, he refuses to move until he moves Madison Square Garden, which he should have done 15 years ago. Yeah, it is impossible to renovate Penn Station. So that dis that disgusting hovel that welcomes you to the greatest city on earth is a the, the fault of that lies at the feet of Jim Dolan where he's like two blocks from here you know God knows what he's doing playing Tetris or whatever the hell he does all day I think the weirdest thing that's happened to Knicks fans is it's been so bad like, like they were fondly remembering Carmelo this week yeah it's like oh remember that 2013 team that lost in round two wow those were the days and it's like he, he had no, first of all, you had to gut your team to get him because he was yeah. so greedy. He didn't want to wait to be a free agent. And then he took an insane amount of money with a no trade clause in 2014. So he was immediately a declining asset because you couldn't get rid of him anywhere. Yeah. He couldn't put a team around him. And then the Knicks fans were like, oh man, I'm going to miss that guy. In the land of the blind, so the one eyed man is king. That's what this is about. Sports Illustrated. Now you're trying to bait me with this. <laughs> Maybe. Um, <laughs> I actually canceled my subscription this year. Let's move on to the next one. Chris, Chris Nowitzki. I actually asked you, I, I also have Chris Nowitzki in oh, your Chris pile. Nowitzki, big winner. Big winner. Okay, so see, how many so, people in the audience know who Chris Nowitzki is? He is the guy, yeah. not many. Not many, okay. He is the guy who has been almost single-handedly uh, pushing the CTE uh, case uh, in pro football with He's, Boston University, Boston University, yeah. and all those people. He's been systematically finding the brains of uh, examining or getting people to examine the brains of, of uh, deceased NFL players for evidence of this degenerative brain condition caused by playing football, and making this in increasingly um, strong case that uh, football's got a moral problem. Um, and for, what, 2006 to 2010, the NFL was like, no, we didn't, no, yeah. no, you're wrong. It doesn't cause concussions, you're wrong. And then gradually they were like, we're not saying anything anymore. And then it was legally, we can't say anything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're settling with players and it's getting worse and worse. It's not, um, I feel like this is one of these issues where there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a class of of kind of um, uh, moral issue in American life, which is, uh, which has, it always has the same basic structure, which is there's a gap, in retrospect, a uh, bizarre and inexplicable gap between the identification of the problem by someone like a Chris Nowitzki, by the kind of pioneer, and the general acceptance of the problem by the public. Yeah. So people start to think that smoking is bad for you in the 50s, and the country kind of wakes up to that in the 70s, 80s, 30 years. Like last week. Or, yeah. Yeah. Very, um, led, I sort of feel like uh, that in retrospect, we will look back on this era 25 years from now, and we will say that the way we dragged our feet on lead poisoning is m more than scandalous. It's, yeah. It is a moral stain. I mean, we know exactly what lead poisoning does, we know who it affects, we know that it is, it is the easiest thing to reverse, we know that it causes more social problems than almost anything else we can identify, and yet we are essentially doing almost nothing about it in this country. There's a case where we've known about lead for decades. Yeah. What are we doing? We're doing nothing about it. This football thing has all of the hallmarks of that. It is just like, 
basically we're killing off, systematically killing off people who play this game. Um, and we, there's one guy in Boston who's like waving his hands and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And there are little stories run about him. And what happens? Nothing happens. Well, they just announced this week that the scientists that they work with at BU feel like they can diagnose CT in real time. So they could take some linebacker who's 28 years old and do some tests and potentially find out if he's either more prone to it than most people or if he has like the beginning stages of it. And if they master that test, it's so long football. It's or football becomes a completely different sport. I don't yeah. If if you can be like, hey, you're ten percent there with CTE, and you're this twenty-five year old linebacker, what are you gonna do? You stop playing. So I don't know uh, where this goes, but it goes nowhere good. Yeah. Um, I would keep going on that, but we gotta keep moving. Nineteen-year-old Moses Malone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I became obsessed with him when I was working on my basketball book because basketball out of any sport is. Right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time. Just this chain of events can happen and you can end up having the career that is not what you should have had. And Moses was a great example of that. He goes right from the high school to the NBA. First guy to do that. Or the ABA, I'm sorry. Yeah, first guy to do that, kind of creates it. Uh, goes from like Utah to St. Louis and then all of a sudden the ABA merges with the NBA. He gets this rap as like not being smart, not being a hard worker. He gets. Uh, drafted the expansion draft by Portland, who already had Bill Walton, who was probably the best center in the league at the time. They give up on him. They trade him to Buffalo. Buffalo doesn't know what to do with him. They trade him, ends up in Houston, and becomes the 12th best player of all time. And it was like this four-year journey of he was clearly unbelievable, and this is just what happens in the NBA. But uh, I wrote a whole part in my book about his butt. He was the only person I've ever seen who would get these rebounds. He would on his offensive rebounds, he would go in the baseline under the basket. Like he would literally go under the basket. And then he would just back up like a truck and he would ram his butt into wherever the player was and they would go flying backwards. And then he was right next to the room, he would get the rebound. And I've always wondered why nobody else ever tried that because it was like just genius. Was his I've butt, never seen another player do was it. Was his butt unusual in some no, way? No, it wasn't like a giant, it was like a giant butt. He was just great at ramming it backwards and these guys would go flying backwards anyway. But he, you know, he's a really interesting reminder, though, of if this, so he's the guy who basically starts the whole uh, jumping from, the first to jump from high school to the pros. Right. The Which, first 19-year-old to play professional sports in basketball. Yeah. Um, and his career, though, remind, is a reminder of if you're, gonna, if you're gonna play that game, and it looks like the NBA might go back to um, allowing players to go straight from high school to the. They should, I always thought there should be a committee that decided who was eligible to jump, and I wanted to be the chairman of the committee. Nobody <laughs> listened to me on that one. But I do think, like, if somebody's ready, they're ready. LeBron was ready in 03. Just send him in. But, if, but when we say ready, so this is an interesting thing. When we say ready, are we talking about emotional readiness or physical readiness? Because the, well, emotionally, nobody's ready. Nobody's ready. This is exactly yeah. my point, that if you're going to do that, you have to accept the fact that a player, we, we're constantly pretending in this day and age that someone who is 18 or 19 is a grown Person. And what we're, no. what, what we're actually discovering more and more, I feel like all the time now, is that at 18 and 19, you're so completely different from who you will actually ultimately end up being that normal rules can't apply. So there's a whole really fascinating part of psychology looking at criminal defendants who are um, in their late teens mm -hmm. and how the, the move towards treating them as adults is completely and utterly outrageous. You are, you are not yourself at 18. You are, in fact, kind of insane at 18. There's a reason we 18 take 18-year-olds. 18 to 24, year olds. you're nuts, yeah. yeah. You're nuts. There's a reason we take 18-year-olds and stick them in, essentially, uh, 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 the military. Uh, well, the military and colleges, which are yeah. it's the, the, the equivalent of closed institutions yeah. that, that limit their movements. Right? I mean, because you're nuts at that age, right? So now we want to take, if you take an 18 year old, you want to give them $10 million a year and fly them around. You it's better bad, have an infrastructure in place to deal with it. Well, the best, the, the best follow up to this is how many people do you know who married the person they dated when they were 18? It's like yeah. nine out of 10 break up, maybe even 19 out of 20. It's because they change. Yeah. You know, I was dating somebody in college that I'm like, wow, I can't believe I dated. She was very nice, but three years, I didn't, it just doesn't make sense to me now. And that's, LeBron James in the NBA, you know, like making mistakes and doing stuff. I actually think it's been amazing how he's handled himself 
Yeah. Day one. Is it, am I up or are you up? Oh, you're up. You just did 19 year old yeah. Moses Malone. That was great. Quick break to talk about Simply Safe. I learned something shocking from an FBI report recently. What's the average property loss from just one home break in? Over $2,300. Wow. Think about it. One burglary, over 2,000 bucks. Tally up all the burglaries in this country. It's worse. That loss number is in the billions. Don't be in that group. Rest easy knowing your home and family are protected with Simply Safe, a fully equipped home security system. Simply Safe protects every door and window in your home, motion sensors, entry sensors, a completely wireless system you can set up yourself without drilling holes in a wall, professional alarm monitoring around the clock, ready to send police. For 15 bucks a month, you can be sure that your home and your things are protected. Go to Simply Safe with two eyes, simplysafe.com slash BS and get a special 10% discount when you order today. Or if you want your security system immediately from Simply Safe, Visit your local Best Buy. You can get it there too. You'll have your home protected by tonight. Stay safe, my friends. Back to the podcast. LA Olympics 2028. Um, um, why does anyone want the Olympics? First question number one. Why this am I? Is like the, it is the nuts. Have you seen those pictures from Rio about what happened right. to all those facilities? The Olympics are just about the worst idea imaginable. You built, who's going to use a velodrome? First of all, the only reason we know about that word velodrome is that once every four years, someone builds it's one at, ex at enormous expense and yeah. it's never used again. Right. right? It's, it's like becomes like a rave house or something. And you're building, by the way, a velodrome is so for cyclists to cycle inside. Why would you want to cycle inside if you live in Los Angeles? Like the whole point of Los Angeles, presumably, is you can cycle outside. Can I make the counter argument? For why LA wants to have the Olympics? LA is the only city that probably could have it conceivably because the, for, for whatever reason, they have all the stadiums and the arenas. The thing that bankrupts all these cities is they have to build these giant Olympic stadiums and all these other, these small arenas and they have to build an Olympic village. LA has all of that. Like the Olympic village is UCLA. Yeah. I don't mean to sound like I'm on the Olympics committee, but um, <laughs> I'm with you that it's, it's hard to believe anybody would want the Olympics, but if we're gonna have it and you have all the buildings there, it would seem like if, if it doesn't work in LA, it's never going to work. Like this would be the last. It Olympics. is time. They have to like, they have to abandon this notion that you can do the entire Olympics in one place. I mean, why don't I think they should award Olympics? That's a good point. To like states what? or right. to countries. I mean, give the if you give it to if you're going to give it to to don't give it to Rio, give it to Brazil, right? And yeah, probably not that either. Not even that. No, not even that, that either. I mean, but you, you give it to California. You, you could give it to, okay. that all starts to make sense. It is the concentration of all of these completely, these, I mean, 90% of the Olympics is something that, that happens in that way once every four years. That's just not a good enough excuse to build, you know, all of this. And the insanity of the, of the security and the, you know. I had a really good time at the London Olympics. I think there's still a giant 80,000 foot stadium, 80,000 seat <laughs> right. stadium in East at London that they don't know what to do. I actually it's remember I ran into you on the street in London when you were attending that Olympics. I was in London at the same time and I watched it very happily from my, uh, from my television at home. Yeah. I thought that was actually better. We'll see, I mean, the Winter Olympics is the bigger question because they now, we're, like Korea has one and doesn't China have one? And they have to make the snow. That's when you know you're in trouble when you're making snow for the Winter Olympics. <laughs> Jamel Hill, uh-oh. Um, so, I, I obviously, I was fascinated by the story. I wrote a little, little piece of background it. for the audience on Jamel. Jamel Hill tweeted, uh, I'm going to say two weeks ago. Games. Yeah, she hosts uh, the six on SportsCenter and had a whole bunch of tweets about Trump and called him a white supremacist. White supremacist. And, uh, and people reacted and then people waited to see if ESPN would suspend her. Um, I was one of those people since I've been suspended a variety of times by ESPN. <laughs> uh, for, I got suspended by, uh, for Twitter a couple of times, things like that. And they didn't really do anything. They, 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 she basically checkmated them, which I thought was really interesting. But um, what I found fascinating about the whole thing, you know, they couldn't do anything because here's a black woman talking about um, a president who's treated minorities a certain way. So what are you going to do? Be like, no, you, you can't have that opinion. So they kind of like half-assed and didn't really know what to do. And it was super awkward. Um, the thing that was amazing to me is they have this website called The Undefeated, which examines the intersection of sports, race, and culture. This is the ultimate intersection of those three things, right? This is a black woman who's on TV talking about the president and calling him a white supremacist. 
and they just they didn't know what to do and they ignored it and if to me it's like you're either in or you're out like if you're gonna have that site it has to deal with this and then belatedly they had a couple pieces and she actually wrote a piece I think that went up today like two weeks later but the whole thing made me think like if you're gonna have that site this is this is why you have it like right now with the way the athletes are dealing with Trump and even your own people and talent and the shifting lanes of of what is an opinion if you're on TV should you even be able to like when I worked there you weren't allowed to say anything about politics um, so I don't know I to me that's why you have the site what do you think well I'm always struck by I feel like ESPN has kind of lost its way. Um, and one of their problems is that they established a brand identity as young and edgy and sort of out there. But every time anyone who works for ESPN is either youthful, edgy, or out there, they freak out. Right. So it becomes pretty clear that they actually, they want to be edgy without ever being edgy. And the second thing is that they, they don't understand in this case that what it means to be in the moment and present and relevant in today's society is to cross these lines. You can't, you know, look at what's happening in the NFL last weekend. You can no longer say that sports is over here and politics is over there and someone who's speaking on sports can't speak on politics. It's all the same now. Yes. You know, once, once you have a president who will tweet about whatever is on his mind at any given point in the day, then it's all open season. I mean, how can you say that the president can tweet about sports and North Korea in the same burst and not say that someone who's a sports announcer can't occasionally wander over into the politics aisle? We found it at the ringer. Like, it, there's no way to stay in the middle anymore when it's bled into every aspect of everything that we cover. And oh. for us to not write about it, I think, would, then why even have the site? And wh but by the way, why hire Jamel Hill unless you want her to be able to... Right. Speaker minded and but guess what? Way. I probably care about her opinion on Donald Trump more than any other person who works at ESPN. Like, yeah, let's hear it. What do you What do you think? What's it like to work every day and talk about sports and watch the stuff bleed in, but not really be able to use the platform the way you'd want to? Well, um, wait, wait. This is brings up this. I mean, we have to move on, but this brings up this larger thing of um, I'm always amazed about um, corporations when they get large enough just become chicken shit. I mean, they just they just. Where's their, where are their balls? I mean, I feel like 20 years ago, they would have had an easier time with this. But yeah. They get so big and they get so conservative and they get so, they forget, you know, they're, they're in the entertainment business, right? And what are they trying to do? They're trying to stop their people who work for them from being interesting. When, you, when, you're, con when you're confronted with that contradiction, you have a problem, right? right. Well, it's an identity thing. When you, you want to cover sports and you want to show games and highlights, but you also want to have a conscience and a little bit of a soul and hire people who have opinions and keep people on their toes. And there's going to be these moments when the, there's going to be a conflict between a couple different things. Then you have to decide what to do. Obviously, what happened with me, with Goodell, was, was similar, right? Like, yeah. um, Goodell was their biggest business partner, and I was criticizing him. And at some point, you have to decide, is the opinion worth it or not? And a couple times, they have decided it wasn't. Let's keep going. But 12 minutes left somehow. Amazon. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's exciting. Well, this one. what should I say about Amazon? Um, well, they're clearly too big. Why is this hard? This is one of the things that amazes me. Like, we go through this every 50, 60 years or so, where we notice, we belatedly notice our economy is being running, run by three companies. Yeah. And then whenever we break them up, we discover, wow, we broke them up and things got a lot better. You know, people forget one of the reasons we had a telecom revolution in this country is we broke up AT&T. Yeah. And that was like, there's no one in retrospect who thinks it was a bad idea to break up AT&T. Right. We can also go back if we want and round up you know, historians and say, do we think in retrospect it was a good or a bad idea to break up Standard Oil in 19, whatever it was? And they'll all say, actually, probably a really good idea not to have the entire energy infrastructure of the United States run by one guy, yeah. right? So now we're approaching roughly the same situation with Mr. Bezos. And why is this hard? Break it up. I feel like he's going to have us killed. <laughs> Look around. Right. See up there? And by the way, and while we're at it, can we also break up Google and Facebook and Apple? I mean, these are just, you, it's preposterous. You can't have a, a major, uh, a, a healthy, uh, thriving, viable economy that's controlled by four companies that are all, by the way, headquartered within half a mile of each other, with the exception of Amazon. 
Um, I mean, it's, like, it's just bananas. We're so in love with these guys, we've forgotten. It's a bad idea to have your economy in the grip of, of a small group like that. Is it wrong that I was excited when Amazon bought Whole Foods? I was like, this yes, be cool. Was, they be, will they deliver it to my house? Yes, it I was like wrong. I like Whole Foods. <laughs> All right. Jelly Bean Bryant, Del Curry, Ed McCaffrey, Archie Manning, etc. What's that, sports dads? Dads who are equipped by their son? No, the rise of the, rise of the multi-generational sports uh, uh, professional athlete. But you is know this... my theory on this. I, I think the athletic genes come from the mom. Because if they came know, from where the- Where did that come from? <laughs> it's like, it's like, um... <laughs> I didn't say it was provable, it's my theory. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> because if they came from the dad, yeah. all of the great athletes would have had unbelievable athlete kids, right? But I think it comes from the mom. I think the mom has the dominant athlete genes and is the one that passes it along. And that's why like the Ken Griffey senior and junior is so rare. But this is, I'm obsessed with this topic. Like I love when athletes date. I what? always like, try, I always, as soon as I hear, like the latest one was uh, Sloan Stevens and Josie Altador. And yeah. I was like, oh, oh my God. Oh, what sport would that kid play? <laughs> that's right, yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. and like when Agassi dated uh, Graf and they got married, I was like euphoric. Huge. I was like, this is, we have now created the best tennis player we're ever gonna have. Yeah. And the fucking kid's playing baseball. I was so mad. <laughs> He's gonna be a baseball player. So I, I love like this stuff. In the Eastern Bloc, I am almost certain that they did this deliberately. Because whenever you well, hear they about this, in China, Yao Ming's, Yao Ming's wife is like six six. Like yeah, yeah, I no, think no. they got set but up. When you talk, so uh, when these guys come out of East, like these Latvians, and they're six nine, and they, you know, can dribble like a point guard, and invariably, like in the fourth paragraph of their Wikipedia entry, you see, you know, so and so's, you know, Sarunas's father was right. seven foot one and something, and Sarunas's mother was six eleven. And, blah, blah, blah. and you you think you think that happened by accident in nineteen seventy seven in Czechoslovakia? No. There's a picture of them in their wedding with like a gun <laughs> to their head. <laughs> well, you know who's the? In, I, although your theory is like completely bonkers, the I, the, the one. It's not completely bonkers. The guy in support of in support of your thank you completely ridiculous theory. Uh, uh, McCaffrey, Christian yeah. McCaffrey, his dad is Ed McCaffrey, but, yeah. but Easy Ed McCaffrey. who is his grandfather on his mom's side? Who is it? Dave Syme, former world record holder in 100 meters. Oh, there you go. The speed. You just proved my Cri theory. Christian McCaffrey's speed comes, is mom, is mom oriented, not fa father oriented. Who's, there's a decathlete who's married to another, it's like Eaton. Oh, actually Eaton, the goat. With the greatest. Married the bronze medalist in the pentathlon. Yeah, that will. I have my eye on that. At, there, is an Ashley, <laughs> there, there is an Ashley Eaton uh, YouTube clip of him um, doing a stair workout. Have you ever seen this one? Oh, yeah, he's hopping the steps. Hopping it's incredible. The steps. It's like, it's yeah. so crazy. Yeah, that kid is, I mean, if. You were on the bandwagon that he was the world's greatest athlete and nobody wanted to climb on with you, not one person. Well, I have, I consider track athletes to be in a. Yeah. I mean, I'll All right, we got to keep going. Now we have eight. Wait, I just left. did Amazon. Oh, you did? Oh, no, no, you did. You did it. No, yeah, yeah, this, you're this, right. me. yeah. Jerry Jones. Uh. <clears throat> so uh, the question came up backstage when Jerry Jones did his kind of weird kneeling action. I don't want to call it a kneel. I want to say it was a, it was a, uh, a semi kneel on Sunday with his players. Was he bullshitting or did he actually express solidarity with? I, he's clearly bullshitting. He's doing it because for an owner, clearly, yeah. I mean, oh, good. So there's no. I thought you might there may be some pushback. NFL owners are terrible to players. They're, they're troglodytes. They're troglodytes. They're the question. The really interesting question for me is if you if you rank the professional sports owners in terms of of how appalling and retrograde they are. NFL last. You mean NFL most retrograde and appalling? Oh yeah, the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever the worst is, that's I NFL. See, I feel like. Because historically, you know, it was baseball owners no, back NFL's in the day. A, right. Baseball had the title. It had the title. And then the NFL. And then the NFL, it. I think there was an influx of a particularly egregious kind of rich white guy into the NFL. Yeah. Which did not have claimed. They absolutely have the, the horrible title. The, the, the wild card in this is uh, the NHL. I feel like there are some, I feel like the NHL owners might be the dumbest. And I say this as a Canadian. Um, and that's so I, I have some cover for that. Um, but uh, the really interesting, so the gap, if you sort of were to chart this by kind of 
intelligence, open-mindedness, and a variety of other, imagine a whole series of personality variables, and you would chart all of the owners. What's happened, the really interesting thing over the last 10 years is the, is the dramatic divergence of basketball owners from other owners. The basketball, basketball is getting all of like the... They're getting all the smart tech guys who yeah, made their money second, in new ways. It's almost like another species has taken over of... And they all know each other, and it's like a big dick swinging contest to see who's like more connected. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and meanwhile, the NFL owners are just like old white guys. If this, if I had, a, if you, which suggests to me that if I had a couple billion, and I was, I had an opportunity to buy a franchise, I think you don't want to buy an NBA franchise because it's really hard and complicated. Well, speak for yourself. No, no, no. I mean, for, I want to buy an NBA. I know franchise. for fun, for fun. Yeah. But if you wanted to succeed, the upside is in buying. One, into one of the dumb leagues. Like the hockey. Hockey, yeah. I think you want to buy a hockey franchise. <laughs> well, they're all trying to buy MLS franchises, and the MLS is, um, which has had success in some cities, but they're making the fatal mistake that history has proven over again don't do, which is just keep expanding, because you get the expansion fees, you get to yeah. split the expansion fees. So it's like, now, Boston, it's like Boston chicken, whatever happened. Well, right, or like uh, with the, the ABA did it. What was the one in the uh, the AFL? Like yeah. they just if you go back, like any expansion league, this was the fatal mistake. The soccer league from 40 years ago was. This is why it went under. But they just can't resist the expansion fee. One more break to talk about propercloth.com. Every guy knows that it's hard to find a dress shirt that fits. Collar too tight, sleeves too long, shirts too loose. Well, I have some good news. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Creating a custom shirt size in seconds. You can do it there. Just answer 10 easy questions, no measuring required. Choose from over 20 collar styles, 10 cuff styles, and 500 fabric styles from classic to business to completely customize your shirt and get the style that you want all quality with the absolute best craftsmanship starting at just $80. Proper cloth guarantees a perfect fit. If your shirt doesn't fit perfectly, they will remake it for free. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS and you save $20 on your first shirt. Again, propercloth.com slash BS gift code BS. Quick break to talk about Hotel Tonight. If you're like me and you're not so great at planning ahead, I've got some good news. There's an awesome app called Hotel Tonight that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. Unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute. Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold rooms, allowing them to pass those deals along to you. Not for last resort places, but cool, top-rated hotels. They have over 15,000 awesome partner hotels in 36 countries. Perfect for a spontaneous getaway or trip you've wanted for a while. I did this last month. My daughter had a soccer tournament outside of San Diego. Went down there, got a hotel, the, stayed at the Marriott in San Diego, got a great room. It, was, it had been sold out. We were able to sneak in last second. Good times. All it takes is 10 seconds, just three taps and a swipe. Get in on those killer last-minute deals. Download the Hotel Tonight app. Right now, you can be like me. Cliff Huxtable. I can't watch anymore. <laughs> it's, on, it's on. Oh, that's it. Oh, that's it. Sometime it's on cable and it's just. I, I, it, maybe it's not on anymore. I, don't, I just yeah. remember stumbling across it once and being like, oh. What's weird about that? Very is, strange. You know, when I was talking like half an hour ago about the gap between how we know something, someone knows something, says yeah. it, waves their hand, nothing happens for 15 right. years. Uh, that is, that Bill Cosby is all about that. Yeah. That stuff was out there for years. Nothing happens, nothing Nobody happens. Nobody wanted nothing to happens. believe it. It was America's dad. It's the, it is the strangest thing. And then the whole story, I still cannot wrap my mind around the fact that, who was the name, what was the name of the comic who makes the joke about Bill Cosby. Hannibal Burris. Hannibal Burris. Good goes dude. on YouTube, and somehow that's what suddenly wakes us a... up to. You know what's also a version of this? I'm obsessed with this thing. Is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a corollary to this, which is the Ray Rice thing. Ray Rice, I think about this all the time. Ray Rice, the Ray Rice episode of last year, was it last year or two 2014. It's totally weird. So what happens is, it is reported that Ray Rice hit his girlfriend so hard that she fell unconscious, right? That we know that he gets... Well, there's a video of her dragging her out of but, the elevator, oh, 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 right? Oh, oh, oh. We don't see the video yet, but we're told that there has been this serious domestic abuse incident involving Ray Rice. His team finds out about it. They suspend him for whatever it was, two, 
three games, the NFL does for a couple of games. We know this. It's not hidden. It's published. It's in news reports. He admitted to the commission he, he did it. To, he, he does it, right? There, there is no ambiguity about what he did. He hit his girlfriend. She passed out. Then, and we're all fine with that, through whatever it is, four games, whatever. The video comes out, and all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, we're not fine with this. With this. Yeah. It's outrageous. Now, why is it, to me, that is an unbelievably damning statement about us. Why is it that if I tell you Ray Rice hit his girlfriend so hard she fell unconscious, and he's been, for that he's been suspended for four, four games, we're like, all right. And then I say, okay, I'm going to show you a video, and you're like, holy shit. Like, what about... What was it about the statement, he hit his girlfriend so hard that she fell unconscious, that you had a problem with? Why are you, are you somehow someone who cannot appreciate the moral gravity of something unless you see a video? Well, that was the Goodell thing, because Ray Rice, when he met with him in like July, he admitted that he punched her. Yeah. And then when Goodell, when he resuspended him, which I don't think has ever happened before, uh, he was like, well, I didn't realize he punched her. And it's like, yeah. there's five witnesses in the room that Ray Ray, yeah, don't get me started. Um, but the video thing is, it's the strangest thing. 14-year-old Bill Simmons. So what year are we, 1983? Uh, would have been in disbelief that I got to write anything about sports and people read it and I got paid for it. Well, I, I don't That's wanna... it. That, it, you could have told me I was making $8 an hour. It would have been like, yeah. oh my God, this is amazing. Wait, I wanna, but I want to know about what... what... 14-year-old Bill Simmons is doing what? Is he, how insane a sports fan? His room is, oh, I have this picture of my room. It's pathetic. It's just covered in sports stuff. There's not a girl to be seen. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, I was just obsessed with sports. I was an only child. And uh, it was just sports, Boston sports, uh, everything. I remember with the 84 Olympics. I think I might have seen every minute of the 84 Olympics because it was in wow. LA. I mean, I just watched all of it. I think oh, it I just ran it the wasn't table just, on it. It was all sports. I love sports, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did, did, did 14-year-old Bill Simmons do any schoolwork outside of? Yeah, he liked to write short stories and do all kinds of stuff. Really? But yeah, I just love sports. You know what this reminds me of? Yeah. First of all, that A, I would love to see those short stories. I have a couple good ones. <laughs> well, there was one I wrote about this kid who ran away from home because his dad was hitting him called yeah. The Chase. And they brought my dad in. They thought I was trying to tell him. <laughs> my dad's like the nicest guy ever. And they're like, so we're a little worried. Uh, this, this reminds me, years ago when I was at the Washington Post, I was assigned to do a story on Tupac. Yeah. Why they would have chosen me for the story is another matter entirely. But somehow I got the Tupac assignment. And of course, Tupac's not going to talk to me. So I thought, oh, OK. So I'll go and I'll talk to people who knew Tupac when he was young. So I don't know how, but I tracked down Tupac's English teacher in like eighth grade. And she said, oh, I still have copies of Tupac's poetry. It's like, Tupac wrote poetry in eighth grade? She says, yeah, yeah. So she sent me copies of the poems. And literally they are. So Tupac at that, he was still alive then. And he was like, Mr. Gangster, hard, yeah. tats, blah, blah, blah. His poetry is all about like clouds and kittens. And like fluffy pillows, and like it was like it was so unbelievable. And actually, it made me love Tupac so yeah. much because I was realized like I mean, part of me was like, is he just is this whole gangster thing an act that he's been putting on? But maybe maybe it isn't. No, he was like two people. That was that, two that people. was the fascinating thing about yeah, him. He, he was, was he was the thug that he would play up. But then there was this other guy who was like incredibly perceptive and really cared about the state of African-American people in the 90s yeah. and how women were treated and all this stuff. And then he, this other person like treated women terribly. Wasn't he was a massive contradiction. Wasn't his father a Black Panther, a kind of committed Geronimo? Yeah, the mother, though. one of them was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one of his one of his. Parents. Answer, I think we're out of time. Run, get one last one. Let's in. just keep going. Let's get one last shot. Let's, let's just yeah, maybe we get pulled off the stage. Let's keep going. Uh, let's see, let's wait for them to kick us off the stage. I don't know if I like this. Go to the next one. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick. You just want to get the runner question. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm going to go for the runner question. Is there one in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, Elihu Kipchoge. Oh, no, what's this say? Oh, yeah, Elihu Kipchoge. Um, no one knows who Elihu Kipchoge is, um, except for runners. I didn't know who he was. He's, uh, he just won the Berlin Marathon. He was the guy who was in the Nike breaking two. He was the guy that Nike tried to get to break two hours. Um, in the marathon, they, the marathon. they rigged it so that he had he was drafting off people the whole time. Basically, he's the greatest marathoner who ever lived, but that's not why he's of interest to me. 
Um, he's one of the most beautiful runners who ever lived. And I would like everyone to go on YouTube and type in Kipchoge, K-I-P-C-H-O-G-E, and watch the way he runs. And if that doesn't turn you into a What do you mean, like the efficiency fan, of it? It's just gorgeous. There is something, this is a guy who can run. So we used to have something called the Kipchoge number. A Kipchoge number is when Kipchoge is running the marathon, how long, so he's running 26 miles, how long can you keep up with him? So my Kipchoge number is mm, probably 1,200 meters, and I'm a pretty good runner. Um, I'm also ancient. Most people who aren't runners, their Kipchoge number is probably 20 meters. You have to run yeah, flat out. So he is running, he is running 26 miles so quickly that you could only keep up with him for about 20 meters. Do you understand yeah. how extraordinary that is? And when you see him run, it's he's so elegant and it's so beautiful. It's just like I was I got up at 3 a.m. to watch the Berlin Marathon last weekend along with like maybe 25 other people around the world. And I just sat there with my jaw open just watching this guy for two hours because it's just, it's so breathtakingly beautiful. My dad used to live in the Boston Marathon. He lived on like the, uh, like on the same street of like the 14th mile, I think it was. And we used to, I used to bring my friends back from college. Like, you got, we got to go to the marathon and watch these guys run by. And they're like, eh, it'll be fun, fun. We'll get to drink and eat. It'll be like, okay. So we would go. And you're kind of waiting and you're waiting and usually when you wait for something that long it's going to be lame or it's not going to live up to the hype or you know, eh. and then that first wave comes and it's like yeah and watch watching how fast those everybody would have the same reaction like oh my god yeah like, this is that's the most one of the most incredible things i've ever seen you know this this is because they're why sprinting but they're not their bodies aren't moving but they're flying this is why you know it's a short answer to the question of why is watching a sports event live so crucial for the future of that sport? Yes. Um, because until you see it live, you never understand that, that particular fact. So you're always, so when you watch basketball on TV, only on TV, as many people sadly, many sports fans, basketballs will never watch a live basketball game. If you never watch a live basketball game, you're fooled into thinking that the players are normal sized. Right. And when you, when you're like, you there, think like Steve Nash is a midget, and meanwhile he's like six three. Yeah, you think he's, he's huge. Like, I remember I had watched tennis for years on TV, and then I went and I, someone got me tickets courtside at U.S. Open, and I saw Rafa Nadal, and I was like, holy shit, he's enormous. Yeah, enormous. He could play tight end in the NFL. He's the widest dude. He's like this. What I thought he was a, just a kind of you know regular muscly. No, he's a the guy's a tank. We saw, I, I saw Serena at Wimbledon in 2012 when it was for the Olympics. And it was the same thing, like, Serena on TV, whatever, she's great. But when you see her in person, you're just like, oh my God. Yeah. She, is, like, she was just incredible, the way she moved, the power she had. I think this is basketball's best advantage going forward of all the sports. Not that, I'm, I'm a little biased, but um, it's, it's great on TV. The widescreen has really helped. Yeah. You can see more of the court, the HD, the close-ups, the fact that they don't wear helmets, just the fact that the guys are so famous and recognizable, and you know they have most of the marketable American athletes now. But in person, it matches that mm -hmm. TV experience, and you see like, you know, I still remember young LeBron. If you saw LeBron like 07, 08, 09, and just watching him like get a steal from mid-court, and he'd be like two steps dunk. And Giannis yeah. is like that now. Giannis is. Just, just riveting in yeah. person because he's he's almost seven feet. His arms are like going this way. His legs are going this way, and yet when he runs, everything is moving together. And he's got these giant hands that can do whatever. And he he's better in person. And there's certain guys that are just like you have to go see these guys if they're in town. Yeah, yeah. So you know what? I had a version of that with um, and I've forgotten her name. Who's the actress in Fatal Attraction? Glenn Close. Glenn Close. Glenn, for, I briefly subbed that in a an apartment in a building in the village and she had the penthouse and I would sometimes run into her in the elevator and she, first of all she's like five feet tall and secondly and she is so astonishingly beautiful in person wow I I have never been silenced in someone's presence before it's like oh my god you're beautiful like I mean she's now I don't know how old she is now in her 60s I'm sure but just like Oh, we're getting kicked, we're getting kicked up. Oh, that's okay. it. We're done. But I, let me just finish by going close, <laughs> because if you ever run into her, you're going to have the same thing that's going to happen to you, which is just like, it's just that kind of holy shit. That's why you're a star.
Yeah. Right? Just like struck dumb. I wrote about this in my book. David Robinson was like that. When he would walk out, everybody was just transfixed by him. This seven foot guy is handsome. And he was just like chiseled and just was like the perfect looking athlete. And we were all like, oh my God, look at that guy. Yeah. How are we, how are we the, a member of his species? He's magnificent, <laughs> like this magnificent athlete. Um, this is a good one to end on. So Revisionist History, season two is out. Um, it's you. an awesome podcast and incredibly successful. Mine is the Bill Simmons podcast, which we do three times a week. You can hear this. I think we're going to run it on Friday. Good. Thank you for doing this. Thank, thank you, you to Midroll for having us. Thanks so much to SeatGeek. For $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on NFL tickets, use promo code BSNFL. Thanks to the ringer.com. Don't forget my column is up as we speak, along with a whole bunch of NBA stuff and all kinds of other goodies. Go to the ringer.com, Ringer Podcast Network. We put up somewhere between 17 and 20 podcasts this week. Go subscribe, check out, see what we talked about. Thanks to Simply Safe, the average property loss from just one home break in over $2,300. With so much to lose, it's as important as ever to protect your home. Try Simply Safe Home Security. They protect every inch of your home, no long term contract, 24 7 professional monitoring. It's just 15 bucks a month. Go to simplysafe.com slash BS, Simply Safe with two eyes. Get a special 10% discount when you order. Or if you want your home protected ASAP, visit your local Best Buy. You can get it there too. Thanks to Gillette, a Gillette razor blade edge, thinner than a single brain cell. And that is the product of many brain cells at work from the thousands of men and women at Gillette. They're always working harder to make your shave better. Now you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. Gillette, the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Enjoy the weekend. Back on Monday with Cousin Sal. Until then.